Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syriana Analysis. I'm your host, Kirk Almasian. Thank you very much for tuning in to today's live streaming. I appreciate you all, guys, whether you're watching me on Rumble or on YouTube. And I know this is not the perfect time to ask your opinion about the background and the setup of today's live streaming. But in the next few months, this is going to be my setup. This is going to be the background. This is going to be my work space. Therefore, I would really appreciate it if you can briefly let me know what do you think about this setup. And in after a few months, of course, there is going to be another setup. But for now, this is what I have. And here we go in today's live streaming, guys. I'm going to address what happened yesterday or today in the early morning in Syria, where the Israeli occupation forces, they flew multiple fighter jets from Israel and they penetrated the airspace of Jordan. Jordan didn't protest and didn't send any letters of protest to Israel up until this moment. And from Jordan, the Israeli occupation warplanes, fighter jets penetrated the Syrian airspace flying over Al Tanf border crossing where the American occupation forces are which means the Americans have activated their jamming technology in order for the Syrian army not to detect these fighter jets. And uh, from the Al Tanf border crossing, they flew over the Syrian deserts near the Euphrates River and bombed multiple times Aleppo, the city where I come from. And eventually they killed over 36 Syrian soldiers and civilians, and also there were uh, Hezbollah militants among the Syrian army soldiers. Apparently, the Israeli side bombed an arm depot, and the explosions were very, very big. In this video, guys, I'm sure that you always come to Syrian analysis because you would like to get a context and also historical context in order for us to understand what's happening today and why Israel is bombing Syria and why Israel insists on striking Syria hundreds of times up until this moment and why Syria isn't responding to these provocations from the Israeli side. Long story short, guys, when Hafez al-Assad came to power in 1970, he wanted to restore and recapture, liberate the Golan Heights. And the Golan Heights, uh, the Golan Heights was uh, occupied by the Israeli occupation forces in 1967 war, 68 war. Israelis claimed that this is a quote preemptive war, and they went into war against Syria, against the Palestinian territories, and against Egypt. And eventually, they conquered illegally. The Syrian Golan Heights, they occupied the West Bank, they occupied the Gaza Strip, and they occupied the Sinai, right? So in 1973, between 1970 and 1973, Hafez al-Assad was coordinating with the former president of Egypt, Anwar Sadat, in order to launch a surprise attack against Israel and recapture the Golan Heights. And these were secret talks between the Syrian side and the Egyptian side. During this time, it is reported that uh, the former king of Jordan, he sensed that there is something is being cooked up and he warned Golda Meir, uh, the former prime minister of Israel back then, that the Syrians and the Egyptians are planning to uh, wage a surprise attack against uh, Israel. And nowadays you can see the Israeli uh, fighter jets are actually flying over Jordan and coming to bomb Syria. Anyways. In 1973, uh, the, this was called the October War or Yom Kippur War. The Syrians uh, surprised uh, and the Egyptians surprised the Israelis on Yom Kippur. And this is a Jewish holiday, so the Israeli army was not on its full readiness. And the Syrians managed to liberate the Golan Heights, or most of it. And the Egyptians were advancing in Sinai. And the plan was that the Egyptians continue advancing in the Sinai, but Anwar Sadat stopped the advancement of the, his forces, and he ordered the forces to stop, and he called the Americans, and he told the Americans that, um, I, I'm now interested in negotiations. If you restore my Sinai through negotiations and diplomacy, I will give you a big access to North Africa and the Middle East. And the Americans accepted the deal, and they persuaded and convinced the Israelis to give back the Sinai 
to the Egyptians in exchange for, of course, the Sinai was mostly demilitarized and it's a security buffer zone between Israel and Egypt. And also, Anwar al-Sadat kicked out all the Soviet army, Soviet advisors and Soviet military equipment from his territories because Egypt was an ally for the Soviet Union. And he told the Americans to come. So he converted his country from a country revolving in the orbit of the Soviet Union into a country revolving in the orbit of the United States. And between 1973 and 1977-78, he was negotiating for a peace treaty with Israel. And in 1978, he struck what is called the, um, uh, the Camp David Accords, right? And the Camp David Accords, before these accords were, uh, were uh, striked, the American side, and this was Brzezinski, was uh, talking with the Syrian side in order to persuade them and convince them to also strike similar deal with Israel. But Hafez al-Assad rejected and refused to strike a deal with the Israeli side uh, and push the Palestinians under the bus because for Hafez al-Assad, there are few principles that uh, have to be met before striking a deal with Israel, and one of which is the right of return of the Palestinian refugees to Palestine. There are millions of them around the world. Secondly, the restoration of all the territories occupied by Israel after the 1967 war. And the third is that even if I strike a deal with you, that doesn't mean that we're going to become allies, and it doesn't mean that we are going to raise the Israeli flag in Damascus and have an Israeli embassy in Damascus. This were the conditions of Hafez al-Assad. The Israelis were not really against it, by the way, and they wanted to strike a deal with Syria. They wanted to neutralize all the military threats surrounding uh, Israel, right? But Hafez al-Assad rejected this deal, and he refused to strike such a deal. Therefore, the Americans in 1978, when uh, Hafez al-Assad rejected officially to strike a deal, they started to support the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria, and the Muslim Brotherhood waged an insurgency, an armed insurgency against the Syrian government between 1978 and 1982. And this was the reason why the Syrian army went into full a crushing mode against the uh, Muslim Brotherhood because they declared an Islamic caliphate or Islamic emirate in Hama and in Aleppo. And they were actually uh, committing uh, heinous crimes, like they were sending car bombs and they were executing the minorities. And uh, you can check this on the internet, for example, there is the Aleppo military school massacre, and you can see how they murdered everyone who were from the Alawite sect just because Hafez al-Assad from the, was from the Alawite sect, right? So this was in 1982. And in 1982, Syria was already in uh, Lebanon because in 1978, the Lebanese government and also the Arab League, they gave Syria the uh, authority or the uh, carte blanche, the green light to go to Lebanon to end the civil war. So in Lebanon, when Syria was in Lebanon uh, to end the civil war, the uh, Israeli occupation forces invaded Lebanon in 1982. And between 1982 and 1988, there were many clashes between the Syrian army side and the Israeli side. There were skirmishes and there were uh, air uh, battles between the Syrian side and the, Lib and the Israeli side. But the Syrians found that their stay in Lebanon is beneficial because this was a buffer zone between northern uh, Israel and the western side of Syria. So their stay there was beneficial and they installed their air defense systems in Lebanon, right? So nowadays, if you see that because Syria withdrew from Lebanon in 2005, a lot of many of the Israeli airstrikes against Syria come from Lebanon and Lebanon doesn't have air defenses, right? Therefore, back then in the 80s, this was in the interest of Syria to stay in Lebanon and repel the Israeli attacks on Syria from there. Now, this was in the era of Hafez al-Assad. Then when Bashar came into the year 2000, the Europeans and the Americans were, okay, this is a young person, he's 36 years old, and uh, we can persuade him, he is a modernized, he studied in London, he likes uh, um, our, our uh, probably lifestyle, he studied in London, he lived in London, his wife is from London, right? And uh, so they thought that he, they can persuade him to strike a deal with uh, Israel. 
In the year 2000, he came and they were praising him. They were writing poetry about, uh, about Bashar al-Assad. Uh, they called him a reformer. They called him a Democrat. They called him all sorts of things. They wrote articles about him. They, they, there is a magazine about Asma al-Assad, for example. It's called uh, uh, The Rose in the Desert, the First Lady of Syria. So all these things were like to persuade him, to give him the impression that the West loves you, and if you be nice to us, then uh, we're going to say nice things about you, right? But um, Bashar was ready to cooperate with the Americans during this time, and especially after 9-11 attacks. After 9-11 attacks in the climate of anti-terrorism or the alleged war against terrorism, the CIA and the Syrian Mukhabarat or the Syrian intelligence cooperated between each other, among each other, and they chased Al-Qaeda terrorists in the region, and some of the detainees of Al-Qaeda were actually sent to Syria by the United States. And during this time, the Syrian security forces foiled an attempted terrorist attack against the American embassy in Damascus, and they protected the American diplomats in Damascus. I think this was in 2006 or in 2004. But things were, have changed in 2003 because the United States invaded Iraq, and the Syrian side knew that if uh, the Americans' uh, invasion is successful in Iraq, then they could be next because this was also revealed by General Wesley Clark that they want to take out seven countries in five years, right? And Syria is on the list. So the Secretary of State uh, back then, Colin Powell, came to Syria and he put uh, the demands of the United States in front of the uh, Bashar al-Assad. This was in 2003. And he told him that you have to follow our dictates, you have to become um, um, cooperative with us in every aspect, and you have to cut your ties with uh, Hamas, with Islamic Jihad, with Hezbollah. You should close their offices in Damascus. You should not give them any sort of material support. You should not train them. You should not send any sort of uh, weapons to them, for example. One of the friends says, who is HDS? HDS is Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. It's the franchise of Al-Qaeda in Syria. I will come to that later. So, um, Syria uh, also was asked to severe its ties to Iran and become part of what they called the moderate Arab countries. And the moderate Arab countries are Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Jordan, Egypt, those who all normalize relations with the United States and or with Israel, right? So Syria rejected the demands of the United States and George Bush labeled Syria as uh, part of the axis of evil and impose sanctions on Syria, right? And since then, they had, as we say in Arabic, a red eye against Bashar al-Assad, and they wanted to harm him because of his, um, he didn't cooperate with the Americans in Iraq. In the contrary, Syria uh, trained uh, the resistance, Iraqi resistance, and sent uh, fighters from Syria to Iraq in order to fight against the American occupation forces. Uh, so what the Americans wanted to do, wanted to take revenge from Syria, and those are all my analysis, right? Take it or leave it. In 2005, a horrible bombing happened in uh, Beirut, and it killed the former prime minister of Lebanon, Rafiq al-Hariri. And Rafiq al-Hariri was uh, the most important political figure in Lebanon and the most important Sunni figure in Lebanon and also in the neighboring countries like Syria, etc. So what happened is that in a few moments already, the United States, Israel, France, everyone, uh, the usual suspects, accused Syria of assassinating the Prime Minister of Rafiq al-Hariri, and they took the matter to the UN Security Council, and they uh, took it um, to the UN Security Council under Article 7, and they um, uh, threatened Syria with uh, foreign intervention, sanctions, etc., etc., so Syria had to withdraw from Lebanon. So you see, when I, when I address the historical context of this, that Sy Lebanon was important for Syria to create a buffer zone between Syria and uh, Israel. So once it withdrew from Lebanon, Syria wanted to uh, uh, improve the, the strength of Hezbollah as a, a friendly and an ally um, uh, player or actor in Lebanon. So Syria actually left most of its stockpile in Lebanon and only withdrew its uh, uh, soldiers from Lebanon. So Hezbollah has, has taken over tons of weaponry and ammunition from the Syrian army in 2005. But the Syrians knew that there is intelligence report indicates that the Israelis will invade Lebanon at, as soon as the Syrians withdraw from Lebanon, right? 
that's why they kept all this weaponry and ammunition in the hands of Hezbollah so that the Lebanese uh, resistance can fight against the Israelis when the Israelis invade Lebanon. And what happened is just one year later, in July 2006, Israel did invade Lebanon. And back then, the Hezbollahs used all sorts of weapons uh, which were in the hands of the Syrian army. For example, the Cornet rockets, um, rockets, missiles, and uh, all sorts of weapons and training. And even Syrian officers were present in southern Lebanon guiding or giving uh, military advice to Hezbollah. And uh, when Hezbollah needed more weapons, the stockpiles of Syria were open for them to carry and bring anything they want from Syria to Lebanon to repel this attack against Lebanon. And Hezbollah managed to kick out uh, uh, Israel from Lebanon again. And this was the last time the Americans were uh, like their patience was over and they wanted to remove Assad Bashar from power because of him supporting the resistance against Israel and not striking a deal with Israel. However, the French told the Americans, just calm down, we can probably persuade him for the last time. So in 2008, actually, the French side, Sarkozy, invited President Bashar to Paris and this was the French National Day and the ceremony of the French National Day. And he rolled a red, a red carpet to him and to his wife. And he gave him um, an, a stage on, among the international leaders like Ban Ki-moon, like uh, all the American leaders, British leaders, French leaders, everyone around the world, the so-called international community, right? But... Their idea was that they will persuade Assad to shake hands with Ehud Olmert, the former prime minister of uh, Israel. And there is a video on the internet that shows how the French foreign minister, uh, Fabius, was trying to persuade and convince Assad to shake hands with Ehud Olmert on the stage. And Assad refused. And for, from the Syrian perspective, if you shake hands with Israel, means that you recognize the legitimacy of Israel as a state. And in Syria, they don't recognize the political legitimacy of Israel as a state. This has nothing to do with the Jewish people. They say that this was a colonial project and we don't accept that until there is a full settlement in this uh, conflict and all the territories are restored uh, to the their uh, owners. So what happened on this day that even the former Emir of Qatar tried to push Assad to shake hands with Ehud Olmert and he refused. So I'm going to show you this video now. Uh, even the title of uh, the video says, uh, it's a funny title actually, uh, it says Cat and Mouse between Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and Ehud Olmert. So this is the video in two from 2008, it's in July 2008 as you see in Paris, and this is Assad standing here. And Ehud Olmert is going to come from this side. And this bold guy is uh, Fabius, the French foreign minister. And he's talking to Assad and convincing him and persuading him to shake hands with Ehud Olmert, which he rejects. And then he escapes to the other side. I will show you the video now. Look how he runs away now. This is the Emir of Qatar now. Look now, the Emir of Qatar tries to push him uh, to Olmert. So Assad stands alone here and he refuses to shake hands with Ehud Olmert. And this was the time when 
even the French realized that he's not going to sign this uh, or shake hands with Ehud Olmert and uh, yeah, persuade him to strike a deal with the Israeli side. And uh, two years before, uh, this was in 2008, right? So in 2009, one year later, they started to cook for regime change in Syria. And this was confirmed by the former French minister for foreign affairs. His uh, French minister for foreign affairs, his name is Roland Dumas, and he was on a, a French TV, and he literally said that he was asked to be part of the regime change war against uh, Assad, but he rejected, and he gave the, his opinion why they wanted to remove Assad from power. C'est très compliqué du fait de l'agrégation de, de tout, tout le monde qui est là, c'est évident, mais en substance c'est ça, c'est deux camps qui s'affrontent. Moi je vais vous dire quelque chose, j'étais il y a deux ans à peu près, avant que les, les hostilités commencent en Syrie, je me trouvais en Angleterre par exemple pour d'autres choses, pas du tout de la Syrie. J'ai rencontré des, des responsables anglais et quelques-uns qui sont mes amis m'ont avoué en me sollicitant qu'ils se préparaient quelque chose en Syrie. C'était en Angleterre et pas en Amérique. L'Angleterre préparait une invasion de, 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 des rebelles en, en Syrie. Et on m'a même demandé à moi, si vous pensez que j'étais ancien ministre des Affaires étrangères, si je participerais comme ça. Je, je, évidemment, dit le contraire. Je, dit, moi, je, je suis français, ça ne m'intéresse pas. Mais c'est pour dire que cette opération vient de très loin. Elle a été préparée, conçue, organisée. Hein Excusez-moi, dans quel but L'idée de renverser dans le Bachar, c'était quoi le but La finalité mais Dans le but très simple, mais le but très simple, de destituer le gouvernement syrien, parce que dans la région, il est important de savoir que ce régime syrien a des propos anti-israéliens. Anti mm. Et que par conséquent, tout ce qui bouge dans la région autour, moi j'ai la confidence du Premier ministre israélien, qui remonte très longtemps, qui m'avait dit, on essaiera de s'entendre avec le ministre, Premier ministre, et avec les, les okay. États autour. Et ceux qui ne s'entendront pas, on les abattra. C'est une politique, c'est une conception de l'histoire. Pourquoi pas, après tout Mais il faut le savoir. Frédéric. So, this is the former uh, foreign minister of uh, France, and he was asked by his uh, British uh, counterpart to be part of the regime change war against Syria, and this was in 2009, two years before the event started. And he said that the Brits started the so-called Syrian revolution in Syria, and the reason for that was because Syria is anti-Israel and anti-Zionist and they are supporting the uh, Palestinian struggle against the Israelis. And don't take his words, probably also there is another statement, this time made by Ehud Olmert himself, the Prime Minister of Israel, the former, when they tried to, when this uh, Fabius and Emir of Qatar tried to push Assad to shake hands with him. And this is a, a newer uh, interview of Ehud Olmert after he resigned or he he's no more the prime minister and I think this was in 2019 or 18 and he says if Assad made peace with Israel in 2008 Syrians wouldn't have suffered from the civil war because I wouldn't have opened the gates of Washington because I would have opened the gates of Washington and Europe to Assad this would have prevented the civil war take a look وأعتقد أن ذلك كان أكبر خطأ ارتكبه بشار الأسد في حياته لو أنه عقد السلام معي في كانون الأول 2008 لما عانوا من الحرب الأهلية لأنني أعتقد لو أنه عقد السلام مع إسرائيل وأنهى العداوة بين وبين سوريا كان هذا سيجعل سوريا دبلوماسيا مرتبطة بإسرائيل مع السفارات وعلاقات تجارية وفتح الحدود كان ذلك سيفتح البوابة إلى واشنطن وأوروبا ويمكن أن أقول لك أن الرئيس بوش قال لي أريد قال لي وأقتبس كلامه كلام الرئيس جورج دبليو بوش أريد أن يعرف الأسد أن الطريق إلى واشنطن تمر من القدس فلو عقد الاتفاق بين إسرائيل وسوريا لفتحت أبواب واشنطن له مع الرئيس بوش وشيء نفسه عن أوروبا هذا كان غير الأوضاع في سوريا تماماً 
وكان منع حدوث الحرب الأهلية So, according to the former Prime Minister of Israel, that uh, if Assad strike a deal and peace treaty with uh, Israel, the civil war, he calls it the civil war, wouldn't have happened in Syria. And he says that he would have opened the gates of Europe and the United States to Assad, and it would have, they would have prevented this regime change war in Syria. They call it civil war, it's a regime change war. I just want to say that I, I accept all comments, guys. You are free to agree, to disagree with me. But uh types of comments that i spend so much time uh, hours of research in order to give you uh, knowledgeable or information that can enlighten you and also give my subjective opinion right those who disagree with me completely let's say 180 degrees and say i'm spreading misinformation disinformation they can create their own youtube channels and debunk my claims and but if they come to my youtube channel to tell me that i'm spreading lies in one sentence it just shows that they haven't done their homework if they if you guys want those who are disagreeing with me of course there are one or two of them in the comments if you think that i'm spreading disinformation or misinformation or blah 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 all these cliches make your own youtube channel call it an anti uh Kevork almasian narrative uh, channel and try to debunk my claims because what i'm here doing i'm backing every argument that i make and every claim i make with statements with proof with evidence to you so that you can also see that what i'm telling you is not just like words in the sky but you're also free to not believe me so you can go and check other sources and see probably i'm not telling you the entire truth or i'm not telling you the truth probably so you can be convinced probably in other narratives you're free right we are living in a free world now in 2011, the regime change war against Syria started, and the the first uh, dumping of weapons started in late 2011 and early 2012. The CIA and the Pentagon, they started carrying all the weapons that they dumped in Libya to Syria, to the Mediterranean, to Turkey, and then they started dumping it to Syria and also some of them in Jordan. And one of the first things that the so-called rebel groups did in Syria was to uh, occupy the air defense systems. And this is very interesting because this is uh, coming now because uh, today, as I mentioned, the Israeli occupation forces bombed Syria and killed 36 Syrian soldiers and Hezbollah in Aleppo. And I said from the beginning of the Syrian revolution, it was clear to me that the so-called rebels had the support of Zionists and the neocons. How did I come to this realization so early on? Well, the quote unquote democratic rebels wasted no time in damascus suburbs as soon as they were armed by the u.s and its regional allies they went straight for the air defense systems and targeted military scientists for assassination now consider this question what could be the reason behind the so-called rebels targeting Syria's air defenses when these weapons cannot be used against them because they don't have air force, right? So what could be the reason, guys? Who gave them the orders to go and occupy Syria's air defenses? I will show you just a short one, probably one minute uh, segment from this five minute video that I uh collected today but if you want you can go and watch it all on my uh twitter account kevork almasian as you can see i will just show you one minute of it and how they occupied and invaded air, an air defense uh base and today while i was doing the research and i wrote uh like uh, in arabic those rebels when they so-called rebels when they occupy an air defense system or any military base they call it tahrir which means liberation so i just type uh, liberation air defense base um 2012 right and you see tens of videos of these so-called rebels invading the air defenses right who told them to go and invade the air defenses i will just show you this video here <laughs> Look how even how stupid they are. Nobody knows where is the Mecca. They everyone, 
every one of them is his head is some other direction and they think that this is uh they call, they say it's a rajimat sawarikh they think this is an artillery they don't even know that this was an air defense systems and those are the ones who were given all these weapons to come and occupy this air defense uh, bases <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Anasar liwa al-Islam. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Khali, khali alayhi. See, he says this is Rajimat Sawarikh. He thinks this is an artillery. They don't even know that this is an air defense system. And they uh, this was on the suburbs of Damascus and destroyed many, many of them. They destroyed Puk systems. They destroyed this uh, more advanced Russian system. They destroyed Panzer uh, S1 systems in Damascus. Somebody gi has given them the coordinations and the orders to go and occupy these places. And they are so ignorant that they don't even know these weapons are air defenses. So why would they occupy air defense systems? And who benefits from it? Except Israel, right? Because those are directed at Israeli air force and not against anyone because you cannot use it against protesters and you cannot use it against tanks and you cannot use it against even militants carrying AK-47s, right? So why would they occupy it and destroy it? This is the big question. The answer is because they were following the orders to uh, create um, a, a Damascus that is not well protected and Syria that is not well protected against the Israeli airstrikes, one of which happened today, unfortunately, in my city, Aleppo. Now, these coordinations and this cooperation between what is called the Syrian rebels and Israel didn't stop here, like given some instructions for them to go and occupy some places. No, actually, Israel has given them uh, uh, real support, like tangible support, right? And this was this story was uh, has been broken by the Wall Street Journal. And it says Israel gives secret aid to Syrian rebels. And um, this is from 2017. So the first time they acknowledged it was in 2017, six years after the Syrian war. Israel has been regularly supplying, regularly, right, regularly supplying Syrian rebels near its border with cash as well as food, fuel, and medical supplies for years. A secret engagement in the enemy country's civil war aimed at carving out a buffer zone populated by friendly forces. So they considered these rebels friendly forces, and they wanted to create a buffer zone between the Syrian-occupied Golan Heights, which... Israel occupies from Syria anyway since 67 war and create another buffer zone inside the uh, current territories of Syria with friendly forces and those friendly forces are the so-called anti-Assad rebels. The Israeli army is in regular communication, is in regular communication with rebel groups and its assistance includes undisclosed payments to commanders that help pay salaries of fighters and buy ammunition and weapons according to interviews with about half a dozen Syrian fighters. So they have given them uh, cash money for their salaries and these salaries also go to the other fighters in order also to buy um, uh, the ammunition and weapons to fight against the Syrian uh, army. Israel has uh, Israel has in the past acknowledged treating some 3,000 wounded Syrians, many of them fighters, in its hospitals since 2013. They also uh, took in, in the occupied Golan Heights these fighters when they get wounded and give them medical treatment. Interviews with half a dozen rebels and three people familiar with Israel's thinking revealed that the country's involvement is much deeper and more coordinated than previously known and entails direct funding of opposition fighters near its borders for years. Quote, Israel stood by our side in a heroic way, said Morata Semel Jolani, the spokesman for the rebel group for San El Julan, or Knights of the Golan. Quote, we wouldn't have survived without Israel's assistance. Israel's aim is to keep Iran-backed fighters allied to the Syrian regime, such as the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah, away from the 45-mile stretch of border on the divided Golan Heights, the three people said. Mr. Assad has said Israel supports rebel groups and launches airstrikes in Syrian territory to undermine his hold on power. 
Israel captured part of the Golan Heights from Syria in 1967 war and later annexed it, a move the international community doesn't recognize. So this is the map of control over um, the Golan Heights. And as you can see, this is the Golan Heights occupied by Israel. And these yellow parts were the so-called rebels. And this black part is the ISIS. So both the rebels and ISIS had shared borders with Israel and they used to receive this cash and ammunition or the medical treatment to them, including Al-Qaeda fighters. And um, this was uh, uh, the one of the rebel groups tanked actually Benjamin Netanyahu back then. And this was reported by the Times of uh, Israel. It says, Syrian rebel leader tanks Prime Minister Netanyahu for standing by wounded. A Syrian opposition leader praised Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu late Friday for publicly voicing support for rebels wounded in the drawn-out struggle against Syrian President Bashar Assad. Opposition leader Mohammed Badia told Israel Radio Friday that the Syrian opposition appreciated Netanyahu's decision to visit and speak at the field hospital for Syrians wounded in the conflict during a Tuesday tour to the Golan Heights. Speaking from Istanbul, Badia thanked those working to assist the Syrian people in their struggle. I will just close this. He added that Netanyahu's public presence near the Syrian wounded was an, quote, important message. On Tuesday, Netanyahu spoke at an IDF base where injured Syrians are receiving medical care. He said, Israel's humanitarian efforts to help the Syrian wounded highlighted the difference between Jerusalem and Tehran, which backed Assad. I mean, how cute, how cute is Netanyahu? He's just a humanitarian. He wanted to help the, uh, uh, the rebels because he's just humanitarian and he wants to show that Israel is not like Tehran. However... The former head of Mossad was on Al Jazeera, and this is one of the few good jobs of Mehdi Hassan when he was like as if he was interrogating the former Mossad, and um, he actually says that they treated Al Qaeda fighters in Golan Heights and these so-called Syrian rebels, and when he was asked because they say this is for humanitarian reasons, right? They want to help because they are humanitarians. So what if a Hezbollah fighter gets wounded and does Israel give a Hezbollah fighter a medical treatment? Here is his answer. There have been reports that Israel has been treating wounded Syrian rebel fighters in its yeah, hospitals yeah, on the border, yeah. including fighters from Nusra Front, yeah. uh, which is, of course, the Al-Qaeda proxy in Syria. Um, do those reports worry you that Israel's helping wounded Al-Qaeda aligned fighters? As I said before, in a different context, it's always useful also to deal with your enemies in a humane way. And I think that when you have people who are wounded and you can deal with them in a humane way, the considerations as to whether to take them in are not simply whether it's politically uh, useful or whether it's politically So it's purely humanitarian, you say? So there's no tactical or political or strategic... I didn't say there's no tactical. I said the main consideration, Fine. the immediate consideration Fine. is humane. But the tactical issues involved, I mean, you know better than me the phrase blowback. You don't think there's going to be blowback against Israel if you get into bed with an, a group like Nusra Front? No, I don't think so. I don't think there's going to be blowback. Why? Because I think that, the, unfortunately, the rules of the game in Syria are such that you can do anything that is not able, is not possible to be done anywhere else. Yeah, I think people said that in Afghanistan too. Would you also treat Hezbollah fighters? No, <laughs> I would not treat... Have you not just contradicted what you told me no, 60 I seconds ago about no, humanely no, treating no, your enemies? No, no. I think as far as Hezbollah uh, uh, fighters are concerned, with them we have a different uh, account. So let me be clear, you would, you, you're happy to treat Al-Qaeda fighters, we have, but not Hezbollah we fighters? Have, we have a different account with Hezbollah. A totally different account because Hezbollah has carried out the type of uh, actions against us which will preclude us from going into what the Al-Qaeda has done. Al-Qaeda, to the best of my recollection, has up to now not attacked Israel. But has attacked your number one ally and protector and sponsor the United States of America. There is a quote-unquote war on terror being going on for 15 years. I, I, first of all, uh, when it comes to fighting Al-Qaeda in intelligence, and in other areas, yes, we are together with the United States on all these things. Okay. But so Israel did not specifically, was not specifically targeted by Al-Qaeda. 
and therefore it's a different kind of account than we have with Hezbollah. So guys, uh, they would like to just give uh, humanitarian help to Al-Qaeda fighters and uh, treat them humanely, give them medical treatment. But if a Hezbollah fighter is wounded, then they will not give him medical treatment because Hezbollah has uh, attacked uh, Israel many times, but Al-Qaeda has not attacked uh, Israel uh, before, according to the former head of Mossad. And the question here is, uh, it seems that Al-Qaeda attacked everyone in the world except uh, Israel, and I'm not calling for attacking Israel by Al-Qaeda. You know my opinion about this, right? I despise Al-Qaeda and ISIS and all these groups. I'm just raising a question. It's ironic, right? It's very ironic. And uh, by the way, um, maybe Al-Qaeda didn't attack uh, Israel, but ISIS once did, just probably um, one time. And this was, they apologized after they attacked Israel. They said, Israel fighters attacked Israel Defense Forces unit, then apologized, claimed former commander. ISIS-affiliated fighters, quote, apologized after launching an attack on Israeli soldiers, the country's former defense minister has claimed. Moshe Alon was reportedly referring to an incident when a group linked to ISIS in the Syrian Golan Heights exchanged fire with Israeli forces last November. This is in the year of 2017. The, the area is a rocky plateau in south Western Syria, which was partly seized by Israel during the Six Day War, da, 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 as you know. Quote There was one case recently where Daesh, ISIS, opened fire and apologized, Mr. Yalon said, speaking at an event in the northern city of Alufa, during which he was being interviewed about Israel's policy in Syria. So, guys, um, apparently, um, ISIS just once exchanged fire with Israel and they apologized quickly. And the defense minister, the former defense minister of Israel, Moshe Yalon, had made this statement and made even stranger statement later or earlier, actually. Washington Post, Israeli defense minister said, if I had to choose between Iran and ISIS, I would choose ISIS. This is according to the Speaking at the Institute for National Security Studies conference in Tel Aviv on January 19th, Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Yalon made a bold statement. If he had to choose between Iran and the Islamic State, he told the audience he would choose ISIS. Yalon reasoned that Iran had greater capabilities than the Islamic State and remained the biggest threat for Israel. He argued that if, his, if Syria were to fall to one of the two powers, he would prefer it were the Islamic State rather than, the, rather than Iran or Iran-backed groups. Quote, We believe ISIS will be eventually defeated territorially after the blows it has been receiving or suffering. And in light of the attacks on its oil reserves, he told the conferences according to Yedo'ot Ahranot News. So, Israel prefers ISIS over Assad because he's backed by Iran. And he thinks that Iran can pose a um, credible threat against uh, Israel, unlike ISIS, which will be eradicated. And nobody wants, of course, ISIS to stay in power longer. I mean, the main reason that they supported ISIS, not all these groups, because if these groups take over uh, Damascus and occupy Syria, nobody wants them to stay in power, right? I mean, they would hit two birds with one stone. One, they would kick out Assad from power, and then they would wage what is called a war against terror in Syria, and they would take out these terrorist groups again, and then Syria would be completely occupied by the Americans and by the Israelis. So there are so many other uh, articles that I want to show you about these cases, because... Uh, this video is just made for to understand these events, right? This was, again, in December 2016. Syrian rebel leader thanks Israel for its attack on Damascus. So when Israel is attacking Damascus, this is from 2016, the Israeli media service I-24 News based in Tel Aviv and Yaffa Port has reported that a Syrian rebel commander has thanked Israel for its attack on Mezza airways in southwest Damascus. Khalid Khalaf a lawyer and a high-ranking member of the Syrian Revolutionary Command Council told I-24 News Arabic 
channel that, quote, if Israel repeats what it did this morning, referring to the alleged strikes by Israel on Damascus, in the coming days we will achieve victories. Quote, we thank the Tel Aviv for bombing those missile bases at Maza Airport. These were equipped to kill the children of Aleppo in Syria. Um, another article by i24 israeli website syrian rebel chief thanks israel for pressing for u.n security council meeting on aleppo uh, speaking to i24 rebel chief khaled khalaf on wednesday thanked israel for calling the u.n security council to hold an emergency meeting on aleppo khalaf a lawyer and a high-ranking member of the syrian revolutionary command council told i24 news arabic channel that quote we thank all who called for a meeting of the Security Council to stop the attacks uh, on children and civilian in Aleppo and especially thank Britain, Qatar, Saudi Arabia and the State of Israel. I think he is mixing between Israel and the Syrian government. He probably isn't really nowadays, um, um, he doesn't care about the Palestinian children, those who are over 20,000 children who got murdered by the Israeli occupation forces in the Gaza Strip. This, uh, this, all this aid, the military and the military aspect, right? But you have another organization in Syria called the White Helmets. If you're not aware, guys, this was formed by or established by a former MI6 agent, um, James Lemesurier. And the main purpose of this group was to produce video and picture materials from Syria, uh, propaganda videos in order to legitimize the uh, NATO and the imperialist intervention in Syria to give them the justification to intervene militarily in Syria, right? They uh, even staged uh, crime scenes, for example, fake chemical attack scenes, for example, in Syria to invite foreign intervention. This was the main purpose why they established the white helmets, not to help people, but to justify and legitimize the foreign intervention in Syria. Now, when the white helmets was cornered in southern Syria, when the Syrian army was liberating uh, Dara, for example, in southern Syria, near the, also in Al Qunaitir, and near the occupied Golan Heights, who did come for help to the White Helmets? Israel, right? Again, Israel saved the White Helmets or took them. Israel aids evacuation from Syria of hundreds of White Helmets and families. Israel has facilitated the evacuation of hundreds of quote-unquote rescue workers known as the White Helmets and their families from an embattled pocket of southern Syria, helping them to travel through the Israeli-held territory to reach Jordan, Israeli and Jordanian officials said on Sunday. The move is uh, the move in, in a part of Syria where pro-government forces are advancing followed a push by Western countries, including the United States, to protect members of the White Helmets volunteer volunteer guys not paid volunteer emergency workers who rush to the scene of airstrikes in civilian areas you see how they um, make the issue like it's humanitarian the israeli army said in a statement on sunday that the united states and european countries had asked for help with the evacuation of the civilians caught due to an immediate threat to their lives so israel again has taken in these white helmets and then they went to jordan and from jordan uh, they were distributed to Canada, Germany, here where I am. And um, according to my information, that there is a big, complete blackout over their information, where they are, which city they live in. And those are intelligence assets, right? Why would the foreign governments like the United States and European countries intervene just for this few White Helmets uh, members? And they have lots of secrets in their hands, especially that in 2018, they staged a chemical attack in which never happened in Douma. And this led into tripartite aggression on Syria by France, Britain, and the US. So in my opinion, they have uh, lots of secrets uh, in their hands and this was uh, necessary for the western powers to rescue them and israel came for help again uh, to rescue these uh, so-called white helmets now we have done all this research and all this information about the uh, collusion between israel and the so-called civil opposition whether the so-called rebels the military wing or the political or the journalistic propaganda or the propagandists like the white helmets now we come to today's news dozens killed by joint israeli hds is hayat tahrir al-sham attack on syria 
Israeli warplanes carried out a large attack on um, the countryside of Syria's northwestern Aleppo province early on 29th March, coinciding with attacks by the Hayat Tahrir al-Sham extremist militant group, formerly known as the Nusra Front, which is the franchise of Al-Qaeda in Syria. Dozens were killed in simultaneous attack, including Syrian soldiers and civilians. This was a video of the bombing. So this was a scene from the attack. Uh, at around 1.45 a.m., the Israeli enemy launched an airstrike from the direction of Athreya, southeast of Aleppo, targeting several points in Aleppo countryside, which coincided with a drone attack carried out by terrorist organizations from Idlib and the western countryside of Aleppo province in an attempt to target civilians in Aleppo and its surroundings, a military source told Syrian news outlet Sana. According to security sources cited by Reuters, at least 38 people were killed. Five members of the Lebanese resistance group Hezbollah were reportedly among the casualties. Al Mayadin's correspondent in Damascus confirmed that the Israeli strikes were launched simultaneously with the drone attacks by extremist militants. It added that the attack hit the Jibreel and Safira areas. The attack came one day after Israeli jets struck a residential building in the Say Sayyida Zainab neighborhood in the Damascus countryside, resulting in the injury of at least two civilians. Extremist groups in Syria have long coordinated with Israel throughout the US-backed war on the country that began in 2011, particularly in the 2014 battles in Kunaitira between the Nusra Front and the Syrian army. So, uh, on my side, this was my report. Um, one of my reports, I say Israel carried out deadly strikes on Aleppo early in the morning while coordinating with Al-Qaeda, which simultaneously launched a large drone attack on the city. Israel killed at least 30 people in Aleppo. Do you recall the recent post of Quds News Network? This is a Palestinian uh, page on um, X. I wanted to uh, send them a message, so I will tell you now what's the story. Do you recall the recent post of Quds News Network, which shared a video from Idlib and supported the so-called revolution there? These are the so-called, quote, revolutionaries who collaborate with Israel to launch attacks on their nation and their fellow citizens. How much longer will these people in the pro-Palestine camp remain oblivious and continue to support the Zionist and neocon agenda in Syria. Don't they realize that by harming Syria, they are also harming the Palestinian cause? Why don't they mention the Israeli aggressions on Syria? This was a post, unfortunately, posted by Quds Network, News Network. This is one of the biggest uh, pro-Palestine pages on X. And they were sharing a video from Idlib the same place where these collaborators and al-Qaeda terrorists come from. And they say thousands of Syrians rally in the city of Idlib, north, I northern Syria, in a massive show of support for the Palestinian people amid the ongoing Israeli war of genocide on Gaza. Unfortunately, what they don't mention is that Idlib is occupied by the pro-American, pro-Erdoganists, and these collaborators who co coordinate with Israel to attack against their own people and against their own nation. And the reason that they receive all this aid is because, not because of the sins that Assad committed, and he has a lot of sins, right? Domestically, economically, politically, but for the sins that he didn't commit. And that is that he didn't sign on a surrender deal with Israel and also didn't push the Palestinians under the bus. That's the truth, guys. So let me know, guys, uh, your opinions about this. I would really appreciate your opinion. I truly think that um, this is the case. If you have any other opinions, if you think that my opinion is uh, wrong, uh, go to the comments below, uh, comment, and uh, give me sources, links, and let me read. Let's see uh, how is this situation in your mind. I, I'm really interested about that. But if you like this video and you think that uh, I'm uh, doing a great job, please hit the like button, guys. It's uh, really important for me. And uh, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Let's reach together to how, how many subscribers do we have now? I just want to check because I'm really 59,795. Can't we reach 60,000 very soon, guys? Like in this weekend, we can do it. 
if you're not subscribed please do guys and thank you so much really for the generous support the iranian putin and uh artemis really thank you so much for your generous support guys and if you like to support my independent work guys the best way for me at least to support my independent work investigative work research and commentaries that i'm doing you can become a patron the link is scrolling on the screen patreon.com slash seriana analysis and i will see you on monday 5 p.m central european time i already have many interviews scheduled for you guys for next week i'm very excited have a good weekend peace be upon you upon your families salam <laughs>